Thank you for joining the Resilient Cyber Show. My name is Chris Hughes, along with my co-host, Dr. Nikki Robinson. Hey, everybody. And today, we're joined by Jeff Williams. Jeff, thanks for being here, man. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, we're excited to chat with you. I've been following, you know, your your work, your, your you know, I found you on podcasts. I've read articles of yours. I've read LinkedIn posts of yours for several years now. Uh, but for folks that don't know you, haven't been following what you're up to in the industry, can you tell us a little bit about your background and, you know, how you got to where you are now? Uh, sure. I actually got into security kind of accidentally. I was a developer. I joined a Navy project back in uh, 1989, and they were building a B2 system. And I, I got to learn, you know, all about high assurance, Orange Book, uh, formal modeling, and and so on. And just I, I really liked security because it allows you to look at the whole system. A lot of other disciplines you focus in on, you know, kind of UI or database or whatever, but like security, you really have to look at the whole thing. And I, I went on to be a consultant. Uh, I started my own consulting company uh, called Aspect Security, worked with a lot of really large enterprises, a lot of financials on the East Coast, helping them build AppSec programs, doing a lot of pen testing and code review and, and so on. Uh, I also helped start OWASP along the way. That was a, a fun journey. I contributed a bunch of open source tools and projects there, and I led OWASP for the first 10 years. And then, uh, I had an idea for a new way of doing AppSec, and I guess we'll talk about this a little bit, but uh, I started Contrast Security about eight years ago. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to dig into OWASP too, because I have I have a few questions and comments around OWASP. Um, yeah. But I did want to start with an article you actually wrote a couple of years ago that I saw. I'm a huge vulnerability nerd. And <laughs> this article that you wrote about essentially context around vulnerabilities. How do we mm. talk about them? How do we discuss them with other people that, you know, may not have the, you know, depth of understanding or, or maybe need to understand them in depth, but how do we communicate risk essentially? Yeah, so, it's, so, it's so important. I, you know, one of the things that I did with my consultants is I trained all of them in how to communicate the findings that, we, you know, we would find these great things, but I told them, look, if you find something incredible, some new vulnerability, some uh, you know incredible security problem, and you can't communicate it effectively, you might as well not find it. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the best way is to communicate vulnerabilities. And after doing that for you know 15 years, I decided to write down an article. After, so I've made all the possible mistakes in communicating vulnerabilities with people, and I tried to write down you know how I think about it and how to really communicate with, with the folks you're talking about, people that don't live and breathe security every day. So I wrote this article called How to Vulnerability, and it really kind of goes through a breakdown of you know, exactly how you should establish trust, build confidence in what you're saying, uh, gently present them with the fact that there may be a problem, and then uh, advise them on how to deal with it. I found it to be really effective. So I encourage everybody starting out in security to you know, take a few minutes and spend, spend a little time on the softer side of what we do. Yeah, I loved that because you're, you're, you essentially equated, you know, vulnerability context and how do you discuss this to a, a vulnerability recipe, right? Which we, we might call like a maturity model now, or how do you sort of increase how you talk to people <laughs> over time? But I loved the analogy of a, of a vulnerability recipe. Yeah, I'm not a huge huge fan of like big heavyweight maturity models, by the way. But like this one, yeah, is this is like simple. Really yeah, this is like a little rubric for knowing if you're actually communicating what you think you are. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Something easy, simple to follow. I love that. Um, and I also saw you spoke to uh, Ron Ross recently because we we had him on, I think, like last year, and uh, was just awesome chat. I think we chatted with him for like an hour. Uh, yeah. It was great, but. Um, I know you guys are talking about, you know, a lot of the work that he's done around cyber resiliency, of course, software supply chain. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what what does security um, assurance mean? What do, what does that mean to software and to developers and um, both to developers and to the security side of the house? Yeah, so Ron is great. He and I come from uh, a, a different era of cybersecurity, unfortunately. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we go all the way back to the, the Orange Book days when uh, assurance was really the main topic of conversation around then. And uh, since then, we've gone through, you know, kind of eras of like risk management and, uh, you know, even DevSecOps. And I think we've lost something along that journey. Assurance is really about 
proving to someone that what you've built is secure enough for the threats that it faces. And, you know, if you just go do a pen test or, you know, you run a scanner on something or, you know, you, you, you do these things, you use a maturity model, you do all these activities, but you're not really generating a strong assurance argument. You know, what do you have that communicates to someone else that what you built is secure against the threats you, you believe are in, uh, viable for that thing? And so that's what I focus on. I think actually almost, almost everything we do only matters if it contributes to the assurance argument. And just you know, real briefly, an assurance argument starts with a threat model at the top of the iceberg, then boils down to like the, the security strategy for each of those threats, then the defenses that implement the strategy, then the evidence that shows that those defenses are correct and effective. And it's, you know, it's relatively easy to generate lots of that evidence and lots of that argument, even in an automated way, but we don't do it. And so it's funny, like S-bombs are like, and we'll get to this, I know, but like the S-bombs are like kind of the first tiny baby step towards building an assurance argument. It's not a very good one because if someone hands you an S-bomb and you look at it and you, you can't really decide whether that thing is secure or not. It just tells you a little bit about the ingredients in there. Maybe it has some known vulnerabilities, but do you know that the developers use those libraries right? Do you know there's authentication and access control and encryption all used properly? No, you don't know anything about that, but it's a baby step towards transparency. And so I'm, I'm a fan of like, this is how we get there over time. Yeah, I like, I like where you're going with that. And I don't want to open the can of worms of SBOM and all that quite yet. I will be hitting that with you in a second, though. Um, and I think it is a good step towards, you know, a transparency and addressing, addressing like the information asymmetry between the software producers and consumers. And I know you're uh, an advocate of that transparency. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, too, is like, you know, I first came across you when I was looking into IAST, for example. I know you've been mm -hmm. in the DevSecOps, AppSec space for quite a while. Um, and IAS comes up in conversations around, you know, application security testing, like IAS, DAST, yes. SAST. For folks not familiar with IAS, what is it? And, and, you know, why should you be looking to use it versus, say, SAST or DAST? Like, what, you know, what's the differentiator there? Yeah. So at Aspect, I spent lots of time helping companies with AppSec testing, both manual and automated. And so we helped... Companies set up tools like SAST and DAST to analyze, you know, statically analyze source code and dynamically scan applications from the outside. And the problem is that those tools don't have enough context to be very accurate. So if you're only looking at the source code, you don't know what that, you don't know how that code actually runs. You don't know what data is flowing through it. You don't know what it connects to. In a lot of tools, you don't really look at all the libraries and how they're being used. And so they make a lot of mistakes. And then you get a lot of pushback on false positives and false negatives and, and so on. It's kind of the same thing with DAST, but in a different way. Uh, DAST scans from the outside. And so it can only see what the application reflects back to it to make decisions about whether there's a vulnerability. So it's hard. And we had this idea because we, we in, in order to deal with that, what we did at Aspect was we did a lot of manual code review and a lot of manual pen testing. And we did it at the same time. And I realized what we were really trying to do is, is visualize what was going on inside the running application or API. Uh, and, and then we would have enough context to decide whether something had a vulnerability or not. So we'd look at the code, we'd test a little, we'd look at the code, we'd test a little, and eventually we'd find these really critical vulnerabilities. So we saw the, you know, I, for me, it was Java came out with this new instrumentation API in about 2009. And it's, it's powerful. It's um, a really amazing capability to instrument code in the way that an APM tool would do, like a New Relic or an App Dynamics would instrument for performance. We can instrument an app for security. And so we started doing experiments. We instrumented the application with uh, sensors that would allow us to see what was going on inside the running code with full context. So we can see, you know, let me give you a SQL injection example, right? So we can see the data come in from the HTTP request. We can see the call that pulls the data out of the HTTP request. We can see all the transformations that happen to that data along the way. And then we can see it get put into a SQL query without ever having been escaped or parameterized in some way. And so we can really accurately identify both SQL injection vulnerabilities 
and SQL injection attacks. And so uh, the, other, the other side of the coin of IAST is RASP or runtime application self-protection. So, you know, interactive application security testing and runtime protection go together. They both instrument an application and make decisions about whether things are really vulnerabilities or really attacks from, you know, by watching the application run. And, you know, our, our results have been fantastic. Uh, you know, we currently protect hundreds of thousands of apps and APIs across lots of really big companies that are now relying on IAST instead of SAST and DAST. Yeah, I like, I like what you were going with that. I think it's, uh, it, it kind of, uh, you know, revolves around context, having context that you t- 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 right. typically wouldn't have with SAST or DAST, for example. And it takes me back to your, your comments about SBOM is like, you, know, you get this artifact, you don't really know the context of, you know, how, how this software was created, you know, what the development practices and methodologies were, you know, how the developers operate. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, I guess, a very broad question. Like we're seeing a lot of traction around software supply chain security. Yeah. Uh, obviously, SBOM is a piece of that. VEX is a piece of that around exploitability. Uh, we have frameworks like Salsa, for example, you know, more focused on the software development practices and SSDF and things like that. You know, what's yeah. your thoughts about where we're headed as an industry? And I know I threw a lot of things in there, but just curious your thoughts about where we're headed, if it's the right direction if we're off ta- you know, target? Well, there are an awful lot of competing standards, but I'll, I'll go back to my like mental model of, of what we're shooting for, which is to build a strong assurance argument. At the end of the day, that's what matters. All the other stuff is just you know, activities and, and some of, a lot of it's busy work, a lot of it's duplicative. If it doesn't contribute something tangible to the assurance argument, it doesn't really matter. Now, I think what's really cool about all those standards that you mentioned is that they're a way of capturing the evidence that you need in a a machine readable way. You can automatically produce it and you can automatically consume it. And so that's a big step because, uh, you know, if you're trying to secure a complex system, there's going to end up having to be a lot of, of facets to that argument. And so being able to express it in an, in an automated way is really cool and interesting. Now, all of their standards are evolving and none of them does everything. But I think, you know, we're starting to, you know, all the, the, the people that are working on their standards and I, I work on Cyclone DX, I work with uh, CISA on all the SBOM efforts that they're doing. Uh, I work on the, the Serif uh, committee on, on the standard for uh, security analysis results. So like, uh, they're all kind of pointing the same direction eventually they will allow us to express uh, an assurance argument in a machine readable way uh, so that when you, when you consume a product, you'll be able to say like, oh, I see, look, they've got all the threats that I care about identified. They've got the right security strategy. They've got the defenses listed. They've tested those defenses and there's evidence that they are correct and effective. And that's really what we, and at the end of the day, that's what we need. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of competing standards and, and guidance and best practices to try to make sense of as an industry. But I think we're heading in a good direction around getting back to the assurance of producing, you know, secure software and, and being able to understand like the methodologies, the practices, the pra- uh, processes that produce that software and ultimately its vulnerability footprint and the exploitability of the vulnerabilities and things like that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, and I, I think you've made some comments publicly about this. You and I might even exchange comments on this, but uh, the national cyber strategy came out yesterday. Hmm. As you know, there's been a big emphasis and a lot of, uh, you know, public commentary from leadership and government about, you know, holding companies accountable, producing more secure software, you know, comparing it to manufacturing and other industries, you know, in terms of liabilities and things like that. You know, what's your thought on, on, you know, kind of this regulatory push that we're seeing and, and, you know, kind of the more accountability for uh, producing secure software from, from vendors. Yeah. I, I think this is actually a big change in, uh, you know, this strategy changes the direction that we were headed. And uh, I'm not sure everyone's sort of picked up on that, but previously and under the, the Biden executive order, we were focused on transparency and you know, we were in a world where we, you know, we were talking about some of the things you mentioned earlier, like asymmetric information. We're talking about Akerlof. If you haven't read uh, The Market for Lemons, it's a great paper and totally applies to the software market. But uh, I always thought that was the right approach is to focus on transparency to fix problems in the software market. Uh, that's what the, the 
vision of the, the mission of OWASP was set up to be from the beginning was to make software security visible so people could make informed choices about risks. And I thought that that was the right approach. And, you know, we've been kicking around ideas about liability for a long time. This uh, executive order really doubles down on, on sort of threatening liability for software producers that aren't doing the basic stuff that we all think they should be doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think we should try transparency first because forcing companies to be uh, public about the things that they're doing is very different from saying, hey, we're going to hold you liable if you don't do those things. And, uh, you know, if you if you want sort of the economic background behind the, the liability argument, they're, they're looking at things like the Coase theorem, shifting burden onto the least cost avoider, which is like an economic theory that sort of works in 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 uh, law and economics, but I'm, I'm a little concerned. It's like cybersecurity is kind of complicated. I don't want to see malpractice suits for uh, writing insecure code and having to go buy, you know, developer malpractice insurance. And uh, I, I think it could be really contentious and it goes, it kind of cuts the opposite direction. Like it'll, it'll curtail transparency because who's going to want to be transparent about everything they're doing if they're liable to get sued for it. And so much of software is a black box. Like it takes, you know, really, really deep expertise to tear apart an application and look into it to see if it has the right defenses in place and if they work properly. And uh, it's going to be really difficult to prove that somebody was negligent in building it. So I, I worry that it's going to negatively affect the transparency that I thought was working. Like SBOM was a great experiment and people are doing it. People are sharing their S bombs and they're, you know, they're they're improving their open source because they're being forced to be transparent, and that's exactly what we wanted. And what what really struck me was in the executive order there was talk of uh, exploring the idea of creating software security labels for software. I think that was a great idea. I've been talking about that since like 2004, <laughs> and uh, there was nothing about that in this strategy. It's, it's now, it's not part of the strategy, I guess. Right. And so that concerns me a little bit. Yeah. I like, I like where you uh, went with this and I wanted to follow up actually with a comment and a question to you. Uh, I think you're right uh, that there's some danger there of rather than addressing, addressing like the asymmetry and letting the market and the consumers make informed decisions around what they use, having the government kind of step in and, and play that arbiter. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to ask is if we go down this route, as you know, there's a lot of best practices. And as you said, software is very complex. It's going to be hard to prove uh, negligence or malintent, for example. Um, how do we define like what is secure or what is you know sufficient? How do we go about finding that given it's such a complex domain? Yeah. So, I mean, fortunately with negligence law, you don't have to prove intent, right? You just have to prove negligence. Uh, and so that, I think that's interesting. I kind of think, you know, there, there's a lot of gray area in the middle, uh, but there's a bunch of things that I, and this is, look, I'm, I'm not really for a liability scheme, but if you're going to do it, then you should probably focus on the things that are like really obviously negligent. Right. So there are, you know, if you deploy an application and you just never tested it or you didn't even bother to check to see if the libraries you're using have known vulnerabilities, there's there's things that are actually negligent. We've known about SQL injection for 25 years, maybe more than that now. Uh, it's, you know, you got to test for that <laughs> and make sure your defenses are in place and they, they work properly. And if you don't do that, I think it's kind of reasonable to hold people accountable. Now, I did a project at OWASP called the Secure Software Contract Annex that tried to wrestle with some of these issues. And what it did is it, it created kind of two categories of security problems. There's some that are like novel that nobody's ever seen before. And, uh, you know, it's not really negligent to accidentally in introduce a problem that nobody's ever heard of before. Like if I, you know, like imagine we go back 20 years and I accidentally introduced a CSRF flaw into my application. Well, no, nobody knew about CSRF back then, so it wasn't reasonable for me to, to understand that as a developer. But there are a ton of things that, that we all know about, that we know how to defend against, that we know how to test for, and that you should be responsible for, for doing. So I think it's nice to have that split and say like, you know, look, 
you're not responsible for every security problem that could ever happen in the future to your software, but you are responsible for the things we knew about at the time that you created it. I think that's a really good point, especially when it comes to something like SQL injection. It's one of those things that I like initially starting like researching vulnerabilities and impact. Um, SQL injection is one of those things too, that can be scored as a low and medium like depending on like how it's leveraged or how it's used. And so sometimes mm. SQL injection gets overlooked for like those criticals and highs, um, even though it's very highly exploitable. Um, so I just, I like that take on that. Um, yeah. And you, men you mentioned OWASP because I wanted to go back to that just because of your, you know, the the time that you spend in OWASP and, and you know, the incredible amount of, of resources and everything available from OWASP. But I think sometimes people think about OWASP as like the OWASP top 10, yeah. but there's so many resources, tools, libraries of information like API security, container security, like there's so much there. Um, so can you talk a little bit about you know, sort of all, all the other things that, that are available from OWASP. Yeah, there are a ton of things. Uh, and it's kind of OWASP's blessing and curse because uh, one of the things that I tried to do when I was running OWASP was create an, an environment that was really conducive to contributors. Uh, I think of OWASP as a platform where anybody can come and create a great security thing, whether it's a document or a tool or a process or whatever, and build a community around it. And OS would support them and promote it and have conferences to talk about it. And it just allowed these, you know, it's like an incubator for little projects. And, you know, the, the vast majority of them never really went anywhere. There's lots of them that are on the sidelines of uh, OWASP history, but that's great. Like for me, it was like, let's let a thousand projects bloom. And the ones that are, are awesome will take off. And a number of them really have things like Zap, and ASVS and uh, the OS top 10 series, the cheat sheets, uh, I, where people are still using WebGoat, which is crazy because I wrote that in 1999 and contributed to OS in like 2001. So I love it. But now there's a whole family of goats, a whole, maybe it's a whole herd of goats. Uh, they're, you know, like, uh, uh, cloud goat and serverless goat and uh, uh, you know container goats, they're all over the place. And I think that's really cool because having a, a safe legal place to test vulnerabilities and learn about them is kind of critical to, to building up a, a, a community of security researchers. But OWASP's curse is, uh, you know, is a little bit that it's been pretty successful. And so, you know, we were able to grow, we were able to hire some staff to run things and, uh, you know, it's it's slowly morphed. I, I stepped down, by the way, from OWASP, uh, I don't know, a long time, almost 10 years ago. And uh, it's it's morphed a little bit. In, and it's, you know, once you start having, like when I was there, nobody earned anything. There were no paid employees. Uh, and that made it very easy because all the money that we took in from conferences and everything could go right back into projects and promotion and things. But once you start hiring people and they're concerned about their jobs, then they focus on things that raise money for OWASP and it, it becomes a little bit of a fundraising organization, less focused on the mission than on you know, building great AppSec stuff. And so now they're struggling with that. Like some of the projects at OWASP are frustrated because they're not getting the same kind of support that they would get at like the Apache Foundation or OpenSSF or, or something like that. And so uh, OWASP has to decide uh, there are some in the community that wanted to stay the way it was and go back to being an uh, uh, incubator for ideas. Uh, and others want it to uh, kind of grow up and go raise some serious money from serious fundraisers and fund some of these projects that people are relying on, like Zap and ASBS and things like that. So the, it's going to be tough for us to change direction. It's a big unwieldy enterprise. Uh, and so I, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. Uh, I'm kind of on the sideline cheering for OWASP because I love it and I'll, I'll help, but I'm, I'm not in the leadership anymore. Yeah, actually, uh, I had a follow-up question there. And uh, we I've interviewed someone uh, in, in the recent uh, history of the show here who talked about, you know, OWASP and its founding and how it's evolved. Uh, we all know that there's been an open letter to the OWASP leadership recently about, you know, wanting to be yeah. more similar to Linux Foundation, OpenSSF, and more form formalized around fundraising and yeah. you know, all those kind of things. But <clears throat> I actually came across a letter recently uh, from another individual with a lengthy history in AppSec who talked about the de-evolution of OWASP, I think is how he titled the, the, the 
article, but basically he was saying what makes OWASP so power, powerful is that open, diverse community. It's very synonymous with the way open source works, basically. Um, yeah. You know, you have a push on one hand for more formal structure, fundraising, all that kind of stuff. And then another hand to, you know, kind of keep the roots of what made it successful. I'm curious your thoughts on, uh, you know, which way do you think may be the right way moving forward to help OWASP uh, continue to thrive? Yeah, I'm hoping we can find that third way that will allow us to have, have the best of both worlds. I do think that OWASP should go raise some serious money, but the question, you know, of how do we apply that to, uh, you know, creating an environment that's conducive to contributors and allowing that ecosystem to bloom, I think is also kind of important. I hope that the, the board can do it. I'm, I've got some concerns about whether they'll be able to uh, navigate that. That's some pretty heavy organizational change, but I do think OWASP needs to change. And that's why I signed on to that letter. Uh, although I support the thoughts in the de-evolution uh, letter as well, because I was very heavily involved in the way we set it up originally. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I, I feel like it needs to grow up and, and uh, you know, open source has changed in the 20 years OWASP has been around too. It's, you know, we can't, it can't operate the way that it used to exactly. So we got to find that third way. There's a lot of smart people work, work, working there. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that they'll be able to find a way. Yeah. I, I know um, one of the things that I like have leveraged very heavily, even um, recently, but is using some of those, you know, some of those libraries, like the cheat sheets, they're a great, like starting resource for people who are interested in application security and sort of want to know a little bit more before they sort of dive in. So yeah. I think there's still some great resources and, and you're right. I think it's going to evolve over time. Um, so I want to switch gears just a little bit, cause I want to talk more about contrast security, you know, sort of what, um, yeah. you know, what you do, what you're working on. Um, do you guys have any exciting new projects, anything you're working on that, that you wanted to discuss? So uh, Contrast is, has been a fantastic journey for us. So, you know, I, I started it with Arshan Debeer Ziyagi and we had this idea that using instrumentation, we could build a next generation of application security tools that did things much better than sort of traditional scanners. And to a very large extent, we've proven our hypothesis true. Like we think that IAST is a much more effective way for organizations to transform their ability to write secure code. Uh, where like, if you just look at like mean time to remediate, sort of industry average for remediation times with static is like 290 days. Across our customers, uh, hundreds of thousands of apps and APIs, we have three day MTTR for remediating vulnerabilities. Uh, so, you know, th that's one measure. We also see the rate of new vulnerabilities going down because when you give instant accurate feedback, back to developers, they can learn. And so not only are you finding and fixing them faster, but you're also learning and you're eliminating those vulnerabilities in the first place, which is really the most cost-effective way to do AppSec. We also do library security the same way from inside the running application. And some facts that folks probably don't know is that 62% of open source libraries are never used. They're never even loaded into memory. So you know that uh, that sort of iceberg picture you've probably seen all over the place that says like it's 80% open source. That's nonsense. If you look at the code that actually runs, it's an upside down iceberg. One third of the code that runs is open source. Two thirds is custom code. And so, you know, people should think about that when they're, you know, they're allocating their effort to where the vulnerabilities are. You really want to ensure both the custom code and the libraries. You can't just focus on the libraries and say like, oh, we'll do the other stuff later. And then the last piece is, you know, this runtime protection piece. Uh, most organizations are pretty much blind when it comes to what's really happening in terms of attacks on the application layer. They don't see who's attacking their APIs or who's attacking their web apps. And using instrumentation, we can get inside the application, we can very accurately see attacks. So instead of trying to protect at the perimeter, we can protect from within the application. It's actually hardening the stack is really what RASP does. It's not like a WAF that tries to block attacks. It actually, you know, we look at the dangerous functions in your software stack, things like database drivers and expression language engines and XML parsers. 
And we inject trust boundaries around those components so that they can't be misused either by developers or by attackers. And that's what makes it so powerful is it's like, you're putting the protection where it needs to be. So would you rather go fix a hundred SQL queries in your application that didn't properly parameterize or escape the data? Or would you rather put one defense right into the SQL library that makes it impossible to use improperly? So it's just a much more effective way of, of finding things and communicating with developers. And, and that's our mission. We have some other products, like uh, we've got a great like developer first command line thing that you can use to uh, generate free results on that. And we've got a serverless uh, analysis capability as well, which is really nice if you're in Azure or AWS, building Lambda functions, uh, you really need to focus on the security there, including libraries. And uh, so you know that's another thing that we've been working on. Yeah, a couple of things you said there jumped out to me. One is, you know, you're wearing a shirt that says shift left uh, and you talked about DevSecOps and, you know, we, I think we see- Well, it actually crosses out shift left. It says shift smart. Oh, shift smart. Okay. Uh, no, but the reason I bring that up is I, I think we are seeing organizations like you guys and Sneak and others try to lead this uh, dev empowered shift of security, empowering the people closest yeah. to the problem to try to address the problem and drive down that risk earlier before runtime environments and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I, I was also laughing laughing a little bit because I've been guilty of citing that 80% number. And then I, I saw you come along and I'm like, you know, pointing out that most of the like you said, most of these uh, uh, components and libraries and stuff aren't actually called or used by the application despite being in there. Uh, so I've had to go back and check some of my things that I've said and, and how I present <laughs> these, these metrics. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask well, you- I just wanted to comment real quick yeah. on uh, the idea of shifting left. And we are seeing a lot of blowback to the idea of shifting left. A lot of organizations have sort of tried those tools. They, you know, they install something in their GitHub repo and uh, they say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna scan all the repos. Well, what happens is they get overwhelmed with findings that uh, you know, either are false positives or that they're, not, uh, they're on a repo that's not even used in applications. And so they, you know, they, it really just creates a problem. So we're trying to focus people on shifting smart. We wanna say, hey, let's, let's figure out where's the most cost-effective, easy, uh, accurate place to do some of these application security activities. Let's put them there because naively shifting everything all the way as far left as it can go causes a lot of problems. And I mentioned context before, that's the problem. When you shift all the way left, you don't have much context. And so you're gonna make a ton of mistakes. You're gonna waste a lot of money. You can shift slightly later into the pipeline where the thing is already built and you've got test cases running. And you can, I mean, it's like, not shifting very far, right? Like the pipeline happens, you know, four minutes after you commit the code, uh, you can be have much more context and get much better results there. And so that we're focused on making it efficient, doing things in the smart way. Yeah, it's a great uh, distinguishing thing to bring up. And it's actually something that we uh, discussed with uh, Derek Fisher, the author of the Application Security Handbook recently, is trying to minimize that developer toil and, uh, you know, shifting in that way that, you know, it just ends, it creates a situation where a lot of toil, a lot of friction and, and burden on developers, and they get frustrated dealing with security when we kind of bring these uh, scenarios and create that, that scenario for them. Um, but I did want to ask you one last question. You talked about, you know, the journey with Contrast and what you guys are up to now. I know yeah. you've been there for nearly a decade. You talked about, you know, uh, thousands of apps and, and, and all the things you guys are up to, you're up to several hundred employees. I would love to little, hear a little bit about the founder's journey. You know, it took, I'm sure it was a, a hell of a path to get where you guys are now. You know, can you talk about that journey a little bit as a founder and going from starting the company to now, you know, several hundred employees and being an industry leader like that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been really exciting for me. Uh, I'm, I'm really pretty mission focused here. So I'm, I, I really want to make the world a safe place for software. And so, you know, when I think about software, I, I think it's taken over almost everything that matters in our lives. Like you guys probably bank online, your finances are there. Uh, everything you, you care about is online, your healthcare, the, your government, your military defense, like I, just about everything, your social life. Uh, everything that you care about is controlled by software. And so I take it really seriously. Our mission is important because we're not very good at writing secure software. The average application still, after 20 years of OWASP, still has like 35 vulnerabilities. That's way too much. Like if we were building airplanes, nobody would fly. <laughs> uh, 
so I'm, I'm concerned about it. And I, I really want to, to try to help raise the bar. And so, you know, for me, the, the journey was having a great idea about using instrument, instrumentation for AppSec, uh, building, uh, building some product and, you know, then starting the, the cycle of working with customers, finding out, you know, where our idea really worked and where it needed additions, iterating on that, you know, for several years, uh, adding languages. We've built out now support for Java, .NET, .NET Core, Node, Ruby, Python, Go, Scala, Kotlin, PHP. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's been, that's been a journey. We have a lot of frameworks to support along the way and, and so on. So uh, for me, I think the, <laughs> it's interesting for me because like this is my first product company. Right. A lot of people in this industry have, you know, they've done a bunch of product companies, but I've always been a consultant uh, and run a consulting organization. So, you know, every size that we get to as as contrast and we're about 400 people now uh, got a big office in Japan and a big office in the UK. Uh, and, you know, kind of every size we get to, there's new challenges that I've never seen before. <laughs> Uh, so I, I've, you know, for me, it's been a real journey uh, along the way. I feel like I got a street MBA. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, you know, last comment for me is it's it's really incredible to watch that journey and hear how it's unfolded, and uh, it's really neat to see that despite the success, you're still learning and growing along the way too. So that's very cool. It takes a lot longer than you'd think. You know, I had these ideas like, oh, we got a better we got a better mousetrap. Cool, we'll just put it on the website and take credit cards, and you know, we'll be off to the races. But you know, you look at how long it takes companies to get to hundred million in revenue. And we're on track to be one of the fastest companies of all time, getting to hundred million in revenue. Usually it takes like eight to 12 years for big companies like Twilio and Atlassian and so on. It takes a long time to get to that, uh, that threshold. Uh, so and I feel really good about that, but at the same time, like it's it is frustratingly long to bring a new technology to market. And I swear to God, if you invent time travel, it's going to take you eight to twelve years to get it out there, so so that people know about it and understand it. There are still a lot of people that don't know about IAST and RASP, and that's a shame. All right, last comment. I lied. Uh, you know, a lot of my work is in the public sector. Also, eight to twelve years is actually pretty pretty quick. Uh, even you know, gov government, it's a whole other world. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, was, I mean that's another thing we got to fix. Yeah, we can't have our government be you know ten years behind the financial industry in software security. That's just not going to get it done. Yeah, I wanted to. Um, I wanted to sort of before I ask you our last question and sort of take us out because I think the the idea of you know the mission right, which is that we all care about cybersecurity, right? We we want to make things better and safer for everyone. And I think that uh, across the cybersecurity industry, I feel like everybody I've met has that same goal. <laughs> Wherever they're at in cyber, they're like, I really want to do like threat and tell or, you know, yeah. whether they're red teaming, it's like, I really want to make a difference. So I really appreciate that. Um, well, I'll leave you with this last thought then. Yeah. Uh, I believe that the, the software of the world will be instrumented for security. It just, uh, like everything else that matters in the world, uh, you know, from industrial factories to your phone, to your, you know, uh, the space shuttle, to your car, everything's instrumented, right? Because it makes sense. If you're building complex, dangerous things, they need to be instrumented so you can see what's going on inside and you can detect problems before they happen. Uh, our software is barely instrumented at all, uh, except for our customers. <laughs> but like, most software isn't instrumented. And so there's really no way to, to know what's going on in there. And so I think that's a big transformation that's going to happen over the next few years. Uh, we are focused, uh, our next like interesting, huge development is we're going to be rolling out some, some great security observability features. Hopefully we can make them free or close to free for everyone to add to their applications so that and it won't be vulnerability analysis, but it'll be showing them what their applications are doing with regard to security. I think making it observable is a big step towards making progress. And that's kind of what the, you know, what the latest uh, cybersecurity strategy is uh, about. Like we can make security visible and the right things will happen. I love that. Perfect, perfect note to end on. Um, I wanted to say a huge thank you, Jeff, for joining us today 
talking to us about all things application security. We even touched on SBOMs, OWASP, everything in between. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this week. That's going to wrap us up for this week. Um, and we'll see everybody next Friday. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Nikki.